question and then I will introduce Omi Ali, okay? I hope everyone heard that. Welcome, welcome everyone to the Ashe Storytelling Concert 2022. We are so happy to see everyone here. We're going to take time to just do a small little libation. And may I have permission from an elder to do that, Hello. please? I'm good, how are you? And I heard that. Thank you so much, elder. That's a lot of it. <clears throat> And I'm doing double, so I'm so sorry. We always try to do libation just to make certain that everything is all right with all creation, those who have gone on ahead, those who are still here, and those who are on their way, the future, just to make sure all things are in harmony. And we have a plant. We're not outside, so this plant is deeply rooted in earth. As we say, and at the end of the first thing that I say about uh, uh, the uh, libation, please say Ashe. <clears throat> we give thanks to our ancestors, all of them from all over the world that immunated out of that wonderful continent of Africa and moved to so many other countries to start up their own culture. We say Ashe. 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 We thank all who have gone before us to get us to the place where we are right now. All of our grandmothers and grandfathers and uncles and aunts, those we know and those we don't know, we say Ashe. Ashe. And for those who we remember because they have gone through so, so many wars and conflicts and still we stand proudly in liberty and freedom, and even those who right now are suffering from Pal in Palestine, in U Ukraine, in Haiti, we stand with them and we say, Ashe. Ashe. And with this, we also say for the final Ashe for those who are yet to be born, those who we are welcoming into this world. And that is why we are all trying to be the change that we want to see in this world. And we say, Ashe. Ashe. And now, uh, what you've all been waiting for, Black is, ooh, storytelling about the lived experiences and tales and everything else. And so we begin. And I want to introduce Omiale, who is going to be our MC. And we thank you. Don't forget, if you want to donate, there's a little thing down there, I believe, that you can begin to donate. Uh, to Ashe, very much welcome. And I am Dr. Stephanie Davenport, and I am just excited to be the president of such an awesome storytelling organization. Ashe, the Black Storytellers. Omiyale, it's all yours. Oh, thank you, and Ashe. Black is tonight represent stories of Black culture. Storytelling the history the experience of our people and the love of storytelling within the culture. Our very first teller is one of the founders of Ashe, the Association of Black Storytellers. She uses her storytelling gifts to help people develop strong imagination, self-esteem, character, and appreciation for the written and spoken word. Velma's strong alto voice fuses the mind, the body, and the soul to deliver powerful story 
to audience of all ages. I present to you Velma Gatley with the story of Fanny Lou Heyman. Hello. Hello, Velma. I, I would like to share a story about a woman who had a very powerful voice down in the state of Mississippi. And if you would allow me to just change myself into Fanny Lou Hamer for the next few minutes. And my name is Fanny Lou Hamer, a civil rights activist born in Montgomery County, Mississippi, Hello. October the 6th, 1917, to the parents of Jim and Ella Townsend. I was the 20th child. Now we were sharecroppers. And sharecroppers, as you know, is a very hard way to make a living. At the age of six, I was walking in the fields. By the time I was 12 years old, I had to just drop out of school altogether and help my parents with the crops. It was a difficult life. And we was doing pretty good, making a halfway decent living until a white person poisoned all of our livestock. And that was devastating. But we began to recuperate from that ordeal. In 1944, I married a sharecropper myself. Perry Hap Hammer. And we lived on a plantation in Ruthville, Mississippi, over at the W.D. Marlow Plantation. And I was the timekeeper because I was the only one over there who could read and write. Was going along with some students came down with an organization called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, an arm of the Southern Christian leadership. And they told us if we only just went and registered to vote, we could better our lives. We could create better lives for ourselves. Now, in my family with uh, my husband, we adopted two children. I could not have a child because a white doctor gave me a forced sterilization. So we took in two girls from families that could not take care of I them. But after the students came and okay. told us what we could do, we went to that meeting and I came back home with a different determination in my heart and in my soul. In a few days, 17 of us boarded a bus going to Indianola, Mississippi to try to register to vote. Well, the authorities barred all but two of us from even getting a chance to register. And the two of us that registered did not pass the exam because we could not read well enough. Well, that day I was determined I would come back and take that test as many times as necessary. Well, on our way home on that bus, we began to run into trouble. The highway patrolman stopped the bus, arrested the bus driver, fined him, and we had to scrap up enough money to pay the fine. The reason the bus was too yellow. But it was that time I stepped into a leadership position. I started giving us and singing those so spirit filled songs like, uh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. And those students noticed my leadership ability. They began to push me in. After I took that test, it took me three times to pass. Then I moved into a leadership 
position. But I'll tell you, then I ended up registering, then they made me a field representative. Oh, I began to move into a leadership position. But you know, eventually, as I said, I passed that exam. Got back to the plantation. Mr. Marlowe had found out the owner of the plantation, what I was up to. And he told me to go and withdraw my application. And I said to him, Mr. Marlowe, I didn't go to register for you. I went to register for myself and I'm not going to withdraw my application. Well, Mr. Marlowe told me to leave that place even though we had been there working for 18 years. I went to live with friends. Friend that I went to live with, they shot bullets right through her house. You know, we was just in big trouble trying to register. But my singing on that bus and my willingness to challenge the county register had been noticed. And that organization was led by James Foreman, Bob Moses. Now, as I said, they invited me to be a part of the group. Now, this organization was composed mostly of African-American students who engaged in civil nonviolence. Well, I guess if I'd have had any sense, I would have been scared. But what was the point of being scared? The only thing they could do would be to kill me, and they had been doing a little bit of that all the time. I attended many Southern Christian leadership conferences, taught many classes and workshops. On June 9th, I attended a conference over in Charleston, South Carolina. And on our way home, we stopped at a little place in Mississippi called Winona, mm -hmm. Mississippi. And some of the people sat at the wrong counter at the bus station. They were quickly arrested, carried to jail, and beaten. Well, I went to check on what was going on, and you know what? They beat me unmerciful right there in the jail in Winona. They messed up my kidneys. I ended up with a blood clot. Oh, I was in bad condition. There was a youngster there. They stomped and beat her. Finally, word reached the office that something had gone wrong, and they sent some help sent help to get us out of Mississippi in that bad situation. I suffered greatly from that beating. However, friends took me in and I rested for a while, but that didn't deter me. I continued, I continued on my way. They were very, very mean to me, but that incident didn't stop me. It didn't deter me, although it took me about a month to just recuperate, to get back on my feet, to function. But those injuries stayed with me the rest of my life. In 1964, I became involved in the Mississippi Summer Project. Some call it Freedom Summer, which brought hundreds and hundreds of students from all across the country. Most of them was white. I traveled with those volunteers and we taught classes, teaching the people in Mississippi about voting. Uh, those white students knocked on doors and helped the people learn how to vote. I went to churches and using those scriptures and talk to the people, using scriptures from the New and the Old Testament. While the students knocked on those doors, I was very busy. 
At that time, I became the co-founder of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And we were getting, we was getting ready to go to the big convention in Atlantic City, New Jersey in August. Well, we would challenge the seating of the regular Democratic Party. Now in that regular Democratic Party, it was all made up of white people. But now in our party, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, we organized, we had a few white people, but mostly black. And we went on to the convention and I was to talk to the credentials committee, but President Johnson got into the window that I was going to speak. And he took me off the time that I was supposed to speak. But it turned out, I was able to testify. They put me on the evening news where people all across the USA was able to hear my testimony. The people across the United States heard about what had happened to me down in Mississippi. They heard about my eviction from the Amalo Plantation. I held that committee's attention. They, I told them about that brutal beating. Well, I'm gonna tell you, they decided to give us two sheets. And I told them we didn't come all the way to that convention for no two seats. So we got on our bus and went back to Mississippi. I went on back down and I did some work in Mississippi establishing Head Start, schools, providing farms and providing food for the people down there in Mississippi, registering voters. I worked with the Martin Luther King Poor People's Campaign, instituted farm crops, uh, ran unsuccessful for the for this city. Long. My voice was heard in Mississippi. I did a lot to promote the voting of the poor people in Mississippi that knew very little about voting. Well, I'm gonna tell you, Vanna Lou sang her last song, March 14, 1977, at the, at the Taborian Hospital in Mount Bayou, Mississippi. And her final resting place is in her hometown, Ruedale, Mississippi. And you can see the words on her tombstone, one of her favorite quotes, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Thank you, the story of Fanny Lou Hamer. Thank you so much. Hmm. Thank you, Velma. As we have heard, Fanny Lou Hamer had a lot to say about the injustice that was happening within our communities. There's more information about Fannie Lou Hamer on the internet. Well, our next teller is Loretta Hawkins, also known as the Firekeeper. Not only is she a storyteller, she is a poet, a playwright, a spoken word artist, and her work encompasses most literary genres and styles. Tonight is a story that she is telling is true and factual, and perhaps a little humorous. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Firekeeper. Good evening. There are myriad wonderful stories told on the internet, and I have personally enjoyed many of them. I've seen a love story, a lost love story, a baby story, a war story, a weight loss story, a 
so many hundreds more. But the oldest form of storytelling is by a human simply opening their mouth and directly telling you about something that happened. The story I'm going to tell you tonight is a cat story. It is a true story, it is factual, and as was mentioned, it might be humorous. A disruption came into our home around mid-December, shortly before Christmas. My daughter Robin came home from work. She opened the door and called into me, Mom, there's a cat out here crying. So I said, okay, because I didn't want to commit myself. She said, it's so cold out here, mom. I think the cat is hungry. I said, okay. So she said, I'm going to give the cat some food. She came into the house. She opened up a can of tuna and she took it out on the porch and gave it to the, to the cat. She came back in and she said, I've never seen an animal eat so quickly in my life. And she said, I think it's still hungry. She said, I'm going to give it another can of tuna. And I said, okay, because I didn't want to uh, commit to anything. So the cat was, was fed another cat, a uh, can of food, and she ate it just as quickly. So then my daughter said, you know, it's so cold out here. And it was the coldest day of the year thus far in Chicago. She said, we need to bring this cat inside and call an animal protective service. And I said, okay, if that's what you want to do. So we brought the cat inside. Now we didn't know if this cat was an alley cat or home cat, but one thing was certain, it was a dirty cat. She was filthy. So we decided to give her a bath. And that was the first instance of our, our distress, trying to give this cat a bath, but we did. Then we were concerned about having a cat in our house that might have some kind of a disease. So we made an appointment and we took her to the doctor three days after she came in. The doctor examined her, he gave her shots, he cut her nails, he examined her and gave her all the kinds of um, care that she needed to be healthy. And then he announced to us that the cat was pregnant. And he said it will cost $400 to abort the kittens. Well, we tried to explain to him that this was not our cat. We, we didn't want to spend $400 to abort kittens of a cat that was not our cat. And he looked at the chart that we had filled out when we came in and he said, um, this cat, you named this cat December? And we said, yes, because she came to us in December. And he said, okay, he said, December Hawkins is your cat. And we said, well, can we just leave her here while you have uh, the babies? And he said, uh, no, we, we don't do that. So we brought the cat home. And what happened was we were very concerned. We didn't know how to help a cat have babies, have kittens. So I came home and I started calling. I called Paws. I called the Chicago Animal Control. Uh, and I called the Humane Society. I called the Anti-Cruelty Society, uh, Harmony House for Cats. I called the Center for Animals and Social Justice. I called everyone that I could think of in Chicago. And do you know what happened? No one in Chicago ever spoke to us. All of this was done on email. Once you call, they would, they would go to the email and fill out some forms. And the forms they wanted us to fill out were extensive forms asking us questions like, does she like children? Uh, how does she get along with dogs? Uh, is she afraid of strangers? And everything they asked, we did not know because this was not our, our cat. So at any rate, after we could not get anyone in Chicago to speak to us even, 
I decided this is some Chicago politics. I'm going to call another state. So I called Indiana. It was an animal hospital in Indiana. And I said, I understand that you take care of animals. And they said, yes, we do. And I said, well, we have a cat that we brought in and it's a stray cat and I'd like to bring it there. And she said, well, what is wrong with the cat? And I said, she's pregnant. And she said, well, pregnancy is not an illness. We only take sick cats. And I said, well, well, she's getting ready to have the baby and we don't know how to help her. She said, listen, if the cat is having the babies and she runs into problems, then bring her here. We will take care of her. If she's having a breech birth or if she has one kittens and the others won't come out, bring her here and we'll take her in. I said, okay. So that didn't help us. I said, I'm going to call Joliet. I called Joliet. And when I talk, spoke to the person there, again, they did answer the phone and I was appreciative of that. She said, well, where did you find this cat? And I said, she came to our door. And she said, well, where do you live? I said, we live in Chicago. And I gave her the address. She said, we don't take Chicago cats. <laughs> you will have to take her to a place in Chicago. And I said, that's discrimination. But I said, okay, I'll call someone else. I decided I would call Kankakee. I called Kankakee and I said the same thing. We have a cat and the cat is going to have babies and we don't know how to help birth the babies. And they would say that they were kind. They said, put her uh, a box in a closet and uh, put some towels in there and she will take care of the rest. So we said, okay. To make a long story short, we now have four cats in our house. They were born on January the 26th while we slept. And we were grateful for that because we didn't have to help birth the cat kittens. But after we got over the trauma of her actually having the kittens, two days after they were born, she began hiding them. And we were just astonished. We didn't know where the cats were going. We had an idea of where they were, but we could not see them because she had taken them in a space way back in the closet. And the closet was a space going up the stairs and we couldn't get back there. So we kept asking ourselves, how are we going to see these kittens? We could hear them. They sounded like little birds chirping, but we could not see them. And I said, you know, one day they're just going to walk out from where they're hiding. And that's exactly what happened. And they were the cutest little things. The cutest, they looked like little fur balls. Um, of course, they were born blind. They were deaf. They um, could not walk, but they were just cute little things. But now they are about six weeks old, six weeks old, and they run like racing horses and they fight each other like Roman gladiators. And I know that if nobody wants a pregnant cat, I know nobody wants a blind cat and they try to scratch each other's eyes out. And the mother, December Hawkins, we have to remember she's a teenage mother. She's had her bath. She's had her hair did, not done, did. She had her nails did. She's got her shape back from uh, having the babies and she's ready to go out to the club because she's in heat. We have learned so much about cats since mid-December. For instance, we just assume that the mother would teach them how to use the litter box. But guess what? I don't even want to talk about it. But have you ever tried to potty train some kittens? If not, you do not understand all of the forces that can bring on strokes and heart attacks in humans. Please pray for us. My daughter Robin said to me, mom, when you tell your cat story, 
please don't say we have four cats in the house. And I said, well, what am I going to tell them? Because we do have four cats in the house. And why shouldn't I tell them? She said, because people will feel a certain kind of way about you if you say you have four cats in your house. So I said, okay, uh, you have to understand that everybody knows that kittens are cats. And if I say we have one cat and four kittens, they will know that we have four cats. The cats have totally disrupted our life. And I rock the babies to sleep like you rock a baby, to, to a human baby, because it's just peaceful when they're not fighting or tearing up. And the moral of this story is no good deed goes unpunished. And I'm convinced of it. And that is my cat story. Thank you. Well, thank you, Firekeeper. I can truly say that that was a smart feline cat. She was able to find a permanent home crib for herself and her little litter of baby cats. So thank you and enjoy your cats. Oh, now we thank you. are going to bring to you Miss D. Yes, Miss D, known as, also known as Lois Gordon. Miss D tells stories from many different genres. Tonight, she shares a historical story of which we and many of us are aware of, but this is her version entitled The Crossing. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss D. Before Miss D starts, please everyone, mute, mute, mute. Thank you so much, because we love these stories. We want to hear every word, every time. Asante Sana. Thank you. Miss D, The Crossing. Unmute yourself. The sky was dark, even though it was early afternoon. The winds were high and the captain stood at the helm. He could see the waves were getting choppy. The white caps were turning into waves. The waves were getting higher and higher. Then suddenly it grew very still and the ship rocked to and fro. The men moaned mm. in misery. Mm. Mm. The women wailed in despair. <laughs> and the children whimpered in fear. On the upper deck, the wind had whipped the waves into a frenzy. The clouds had began to release the rain and together they seemed to be water everywhere. The crew was trying to get the water out with buckets before the ship began to sink. They were fearful that that might happen because there was so much water everywhere. The captain grew afraid because he had never been through a storm like that before. And he wasn't sure of what was going to happen next. He decided that perhaps it would be safer for him if he got into the hold 
of the ship. So he opened the hatch and began to step down into the bottom before he realized that he could not breathe. The stench coming from the hold was more than he could bear. So he went back up to the top and watched the waves as they came over the bow. Each time a wave came, it seemed like it was higher and higher until as high as a 10 foot building, the wave washed over the ship. The captain was knocked to his knees. He tried to get up, but there was more water everywhere. He began to remember the stories from the Bible that his mother used to tell him. He had not thought about that in a long, long time. But just then he was fearful for his life. And well, he should have been. And at that time, he began to think about what was going to happen to him in the future. He didn't know, but he was afraid more than he had ever been on the ship before. He thought about the people who were down in the hold of the ship. The men moaned in misery. The women wailed in despair. And the children whimpered in fear. That night, Captain John Newton wrote Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind. But now I see. And then the captain said, Turn the ship around. What did he say? I don't know. What, did he, what does he want us to do? Ask him to say it again. I don't know what he said. And they said, Captain, what are you saying? And the captain said, turn the ship around. They couldn't believe their ears, but he was the captain and they must do what he said. And so they did. They turned the ship around and they headed back to Africa. And when they arrived, they opened the ship's hold and allowed all of the people, the men, the women, and the children, to get off of the ship. John Newton went back to England with no cargo in his hold. And he began to talk about abolition. He became a strong supporter of abolition. And everyone who would listen to him, he would talk about how wrong it was to bring people from their country to theirs. He eventually became a minister 
at the Church of England and talked about abolition every single opportunity that he had. The poem he wrote became a song that was sung around the world and everyone knew who he was. He never forgot the sight of the people who were crammed down in the hole, pushed together spoon fashion, almost unable to breathe themselves. So much that he wrote that song, he would never, ever forget what he saw for the first time when he looked into the hold and saw the misery of the people that he had there. The men moaned mm. in misery. The women wailed in despair. And the children whimpered in fear. And so it was. Mm. Thank you. Wow, what a life threatening and horrible journey. Chain in the bottom of a ship. I can only imagine. And just to know that some of us are here today because of our ancestors, those who were able to survive many of the torturous journeys across the ocean. But how, how wonderful it is to know that the heart can be touched, attitudes can be changed. Thank, thank God for people whose heart and attitudes and minds was changed because of what they saw from other people being chained in the bottom of a ship. Thank you, Miss D, for that beautiful story. Well, here we go again. Now you're going to hear a personal story. Personal stories can leave you with words of wisdom. Demana, surely, creates personal stories that entertain, stories that educate and uplift. Demana's goal is to create images that allow the listener to see as well as to hear her stories. The title of the modern story tonight is The Road Trip. The modern, The Road Trip. Several summers ago, my youngest daughter Kay drove home to Chicago from Atlanta where she had just finished grad school. She wanted to hang out with family and friends that summer before she went back to start her first real job as a teacher in the fall. I decided to ride back with her because I didn't want her on the road alone all that time. Then we found out that longtime friends, Cheryl and her daughter Imani, also were going to Atlanta to spend some time with relatives. So we made it into a road trip, spread it out over two days, spending the night in Louisville, Kentucky, which is about halfway. I decided to drive, not because I was being nice, but so I could control the radio because the musical stylings of Nelly, Lil Wayne and Fiddy did not warm my heart nor feed my soul. We had been on the road for about 30 minutes when my daughter said, oh my, 
are we going through Missouri? No, why do you ask? Oh, because there's a restaurant in Missouri where they throw rolls at you. They do what? They throw dinner rolls, ma. It's called Lambert's and it's in Sykes in Missouri. One of my classmates lives there. And she said on the way back, we need to stop because it's so much fun. Can we go? Not too much in here. I think No, because going through Missouri would take us too far out of the way. And besides, being hit with dinner rolls is not on my bucket list. Oh my, you're no fun. That's hilarious. Then Imani, Imani chimed in. Yeah, Miss Shaori, you're no fun at all. I looked at Cheryl and I kept driving. We stopped about halfway to Louisville to gas up and to eat lunch. And that is a story unto itself. I figured since it was right off I-64, there would be well-known restaurants like Pot Belly, Panera Bread, or maybe a Chinese or a Mexican restaurant where we knew the menu. That did not happen. Most of the restaurants in the area advertised pulled pork, which is not quite a staple in Chicago restaurants. So we just flipped a coin and picked one. The menu was indeed extensive, but not at all familiar. Some of the highlights were tomato pie, every kind of barbecue known to humankind. Oh, um, I can't remember the foods that they had at this terrible restaurant. Oh, fried tacos. I bet you didn't know a taco needed to be fried, did you? Chili with absolutely no beans. And last, but certainly not least, fried pickle sandwich with pimento spread. Yes, a fried pickle sandwich. Fortunately, they also serve shrimp and grits. We figured that would be safe. So we ordered that. And at the server's suggestion, we also ordered sweet tea. And it was really, really sweet. Welcome to Kentucky. About 30 minutes later, when we were on the road again, Cheryl overheard something in the back seat and she turned. Are you all talking about David? I thought I heard his name. David was Cheryl's current man friend. And I already learned from Kay that Imani was not a fan. Yeah, Ma, I was just telling Kay how often David is at the house. It's kind of like he's my new daddy or something. Of course, you could have heard a pin drop. Or as my grandmother used to say, it was so quiet, you could hear a mouse pee on cotton. What are you talking about, Imani? David's not at the house that often. He's not even there every week. Besides, I enjoy his company. And if you're unhappy with the way things are, at, on 22nd in Wabash, maybe you need to go live with your old daddy or something. To everyone's surprise, Imani continued undaunted. Ma, you know, I am not trying to go live with daddy. That woman he's with is psychotic. Besides, I didn't say anything bad about David. I just said he's at the house a lot. Well, it is my house, Imani. David's there because I enjoy his company. I don't know what the problem is. Ma, like the time David came to the airport with you when you picked me up, we're not a family. Why was he even there? No, Imani, we're not a family. But David came with me because you came in on a very late flight. And he didn't want me to drive to O'Hare by myself. He was looking out for me. I would think you would be glad someone's looking out for your mom. That statement silenced the people in the back seat. By the time we got to St. Luke, um, Kent oh, Jesus, Churchill Downs, 
Louisville. By the time we got to Louisville, we were all very tired. So we decided to get takeout. The restaurant was near Churchill Downs, so there were plenty of good restaurants around. We checked into the hotel and I took my luggage into the room that I was sharing with Cheryl. Kay came to the door. Ma, can we talk about this? We think you guys really don't understand how we're feeling. I looked at Cheryl, she nodded. So the four of us sat down to eat and talk. Kay went first. Ma, we know that you all are grown women and you have the right to date whoever you want to date. But sometimes it seems like you just don't care about how we feel. You don't take our feelings into consideration at all. Like the time you had Jonathan at the house for Thanksgiving, for the holidays last year. He was there for three or four days. He's not family. No, okay, he's not family. But I wanted to spend the holidays with him. And he lived two hours away. And I didn't see the sense in him driving back and forth every day. Besides, I didn't choose him over the three of you. The three of you knew him. He wasn't a stranger. But Ma, you did choose him over us. If you had chosen us, he wouldn't have been there. I came home to spend Christmas with you, my brother and my sister, not Jonathan. I don't even know why he was there. I struggled for the right words to say because I didn't want to say anything to make it worse. But before I could say anything, Kay started to cry. I put my arms around her and the way she held on to me, let me know how she had been feeling all that time. I told her that perhaps I could have done things differently and only had Jonathan at the house part of the time. And I also explained to both her and Imani that since Cheryl and I were not with their fathers anymore, they would need to get used to seeing us with other men. But it was new territory for all of us. And it might not be easy, but it's something we could definitely work on together and make it work. Kay agreed and Cheryl and Imani nodded. We were all emotionally exhausted. So after a tearful group hug, we all went to bed. The next morning when we got on the road, Cheryl and I were thrilled that the conversation did not return to the subject of the men in our lives. Instead, our daughters told us that they had thought about it, talked about it, and they realized that they didn't expect to have any kind of veto power over the men we might date. And even if he turned out to be a complete train wreck, they would still be civil toward him. Cheryl and I saw that as definite progress. Mm. We listened to the Motown station for the rest of the trip, singing loudly and with feeling. I never met a girl who makes me feel the way that you do, you're all right. Songs that were recorded long before our daughters were even born, but songs that they knew very well because we had raised them right. Just then Imani shouted, we're here and pointed to a sign, Georgia welcomes you. We got to Cheryl's cousin's house and everyone came out to say hello because that is Southern hospitality. And before we left, she gave us bottles of both water and sweet tea. And even though it might have been too sweet to drink, I sincerely thanked her for her kindness. We left, went to my daughter's apartment and she immediately changed and went down to the pool. And the rest is history. Cheryl and I were very happy that our daughters had come to some reconciliation about the men in our lives, but we had no doubt at all that we had not heard the last from them. 
but it was a very good trip. The four of us had come closer together and we all had more insight and a better understanding of how everybody felt about this. We were so glad we had made that trip together. It's no surprise that Cheryl and I are no longer with the men that had our daughters so upset. But even if we were, our daughters know beyond a doubt that we would never let a man come between us. Unless we're talking about Idris Elba, <laughs> Denzel, or maybe Lawrence Fishburne, or, thank you. Well, thank you. I must say, <clears throat> communication is very important. You never know what a person or how a person thinks or how they feel if you don't ask. So communication is most important. Thank you again, Imani. Thank you. May I present our final teller, Patricia Red, whose storytelling name is Serenity. Serenity tells tales of, <clears throat> excuse me, yesterday that transform your tomorrow. Her selection includes folk, fictional, cultural, spiritual, and personal stories. Serenity believes that stories are gifts wrapped up in the spirit of breath. Hear now an original story that she has written about a powerful historic figure. Now this storyteller is on a journey to edify and inspire through the power of story. I present to you our serenity. Serenity. Wangari Matai, Wangari Matai, Wangari Matai left a legacy behind. Wangari Matai, Wangari Matai, Wangari Matai left the legacy behind. Wangari Matai was an environmental and a political activist. A first generation college bound student, she was a triple threat because she not only earned a bachelor's degree, but a master's degree and a PhD in less than 10 years time. I would have to say that Wangari was a bad mama jamma. Now there are those who left legacies behind when they passed from this life to the next, but not Wangari. Wangari began her legacy long before her death in 2011, whether she knew it or not. It was always her plan to return back to her beloved country of Kenya so that she could help restore it and beautify it. Sadly, on her many trips back and forth through her college years, she noticed that the trees were becoming depleted, almost as if the land was becoming barren. Specifically, she noticed that there were fewer and fewer fig trees. The fig tree 
was sacred to her people. So sacred was the fig tree that even as a little girl, maybe about five or six years old, she knew better than to pick the branches off the ground of the fig tree and use it as firewood. More about that later. All while growing up, Wangari saw her people living off the land. They ate everything they grew. They were happy, healthy, and wealthy in their own right because they worked that land together and they supported one another. But what Wangari witnessed upon her return was utterly devastating because the people were no longer eating the food that they grew. They were buying it all from the store. Not only was it costly, but it wasn't even that good for them because some of it had additives in it. Without unmuting yourselves, what I would like to see you do is ask the question, what happened? Well, let me tell you what happened. What happened? The powers that be decided that they were going to cut down the trees. They cut down those trees day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year, so they could clear away more and more land for farming. But not so that the people could grow the food to eat but so that they could sell it. Now the people of the villages, they were becoming complacent and they were becoming hopeless simply because they could not take care of the land the way they used to. And the women and children, it was their job to go and gather firewood so they could keep their homes warm and cook their meals. But they found themselves walking miles and miles just to find a tree or a bush. Now, you remember when I told you about Wangari, that even though she was about five or six years of age, that she knew better than to pick those branches off the ground of the fig tree, well, I can only imagine that the women and the children must have felt some kind of way and probably even a little bit traumatized because if they walked that many miles and they came across a fig tree, guess what? They probably used those branches. This broke Wangari's heart just thinking about all of this, but it did not break her spirit because she knew she had to do something and do something she did. With the PhD that she had earned in the biological sciences, Wangari went back to her village and she taught all of the women there how to cultivate the land. And then she taught them how to take the seedlings from the trees that once populated the land and she taught them how to grow them. Now, all the seedlings didn't make it, but that didn't discourage Wankari. And because she was the type of person she was, she encouraged the women too, so that they would not get discouraged as well. And before long, those trees had started to take root and grow. Now there were those that were cutting down those trees that still wanted to try to cut down the trees that were being planted new. 
Bawangari and those that stood with her, they were going to protect the environment. And they used their bodies as human shields. Did you hear me? They used their bodies as human shields to keep those trees from being cut down. I'm not sure I could have done that, but they did. I'm sure it didn't take days. It probably took weeks and weeks before they were able to stop them, but they did. And victory was theirs. It was on after that. Wangari went from village to village, teaching the women about the benefits of planting trees. She taught them well. She went into the prisons where the men were, unfortunately. And she talked to them about why it was important to plant a variety of trees. She taught them well. She went into the schoolhouses and she talked to the children of every grade level about the sacredness of that fig tree. And she told them they didn't have to wait until they were grown to plant them. She taught them well. And the people of Kenya, <laughs> they became happier and healthier in every way, in body, mind, and spirit. Wankari. Wangari's legacy was the greening of Kenya. And the people that stood with her, they could boast of having planted 30 million trees where once the land was becoming barren. Now, as far as the eye could see, there were trees growing everywhere with deep roots. Wangari and the people of Kenya, they fought a good fight. Mm. They ran a good race. And there's an expression that if you stand for nothing, you fall for anything. But that was not the case with Wangari. They planted so many trees, but most specifically, they planted the fig tree. Now this just happens to be Women's History Month. And in honor of Wangari and women everywhere. I invite you to stand, to raise your hand, to shout hallelujah, whatever it is you want to do to celebrate women. And most especially, Wangari. Mm. Wangari. Wangari. Wangari Matai Wangari Wangari Left a legacy behind Thank you. Mm. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I have a relative who lives in Gulfport, Mississippi, and he has one of the most biggest, beautiful fig trees I've ever seen. And at harvest time, he tried to make certain that everyone who wants some figs is able to get them, and he will even ship them to us. But, you know, we can help each other in so many ways. Just think about it. each one, teach one. 
each one teach one. You have heard all the stories. We hope that each have touched you in a special way, in a special way at your heart, in a special way at your soul, in a special way in your spirit. Now, I introduce to you our Vice President, Dr. Elijah Hall. I'm just feeling all of the all of the energy. Thank you so much. Yes, um, I I just want to thank everyone. Thank our host, Mama Omiya. I don't know how you kept your cool through all those different stories. With she was talking about kittens, and you didn't you didn't flinch, and then she was the daughters, and you was just straight face. I love it. It's great. We have so many wonderful people. I've uh, all stepped into the plate today. Um, and it's just from the top to bottom. I'm so uh, happy to and proud uh, to be a member of Ashe, and not just um, for what we were able to see um, tonight and phenomenal stories from everyone. And as Mama Pat said, you know it is uh, Women's History Month, but um, to everyone who is here, um, you all made this a very special and unique uh, uh, day for us. You know. Um, and, you know, just thank, we just want to give you all a round of applause, everybody who's here, who was able to donate to um, Ashe. Um, we raised quite a bit today, um, and we thank you. It's, it is a, a huge, 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 huge honor. So thank you all for coming out um, and uh, just showing the love. That's to us as storytellers, that kind of love that you share in a space and in a, in a forum like this um, is so important. It means, it means the world to us. We don't know when we put out these shows, who's gonna show up, who's gonna donate, what are people gonna do? And you all showed up and showed out, okay? So thank you uh, for that. This is our website, if you did not know, um, you know, check us out on our website, we keep up our events here and our mission and, and things that were going on. And, and if you um, want to share with someone and say, hey, I heard these stories and they were phenomenal, you need to check them out. You should support them because we here uh, are all volunteers. You heard right. Every single one of us um, is a volunteer here. And so absolutely, um, you know, uh, if uh, you want to donate, we accept. We accept it. We appreciate it, um, and 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 we just really appreciate you all around. Uh, so so thank you to those that did donate. Um, we were able to raise uh, over a thousand dollars for today's show. Okay, so let's just give it up. That's that's big. That's big. That's big right there. That's big. That's big. That's big. That's big. That's big. Okay. So um, I'm going to turn it back over to our host. Thank you all. Please spread the word. Ashe, we are here. We are not going anywhere. In fact, we are, we are getting, you know, we're getting stronger. We are getting more wiser. We're, 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 getting, we're getting deeper, as they say. We're getting more beautiful. We're getting finer. Okay, more fine. Okay, Mama Demana says she's 50 fine. Okay, we got 30 fine. We got 40 fine. We got 50 fine. We got city fine. City. The city, not 60, but city fine, okay? We got 75, we definitely got 85, okay? So we we, we coming, all right? And uh, that's just how it is. We, we love it here. We love you all. Thank you so much. coming we had it we love we enjoyed the show we could sit through it again <laughs> it was beautiful yeah unity thank, you. thank you everyone for seeing your faces in these little square spaces mean a lot yes 
<laughs> yes. They do. Oh, Miriam, that's so wonderful. good to see you. We haven't seen you in so long, Miriam. Miriam. Hope everyone has a lovely rest of the evening and a great tomorrow. And enjoy right. Women's Month. And a safe, oh, have a blessing, weekend. everybody. Okay. Enjoy. Bye. Thank you for coming. And blessings. Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you all for coming. Everybody. Thank you all. For coming. Everybody. Thank, you, it was awesome. Thank you all. It was wonderful. It was beautiful. Yes. Th thanks all the, to all of my Arizona folks. Thank you for showing up and showing out. And everyone, all right, all right. Tanya, I see you. Yeah, okay. I second that emotion. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> and uh, and, and Ashay, glory. we always I say that everybody has a story. Each and yes. every last one of you uh, have a story right inside of that big heart and everyone thank has a you, voice oh my yes great job Omiyale. thank great you job. so much it yes. was wonderful it was beautiful hey auntie dolores it's marcellus how you doing hey marcellus so how glad to hear from you it's good to, i'm glad to see you you were lively and everything had me <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, great. I see my niece Vina is out there too. Look at that. Thank you, baby, with the cat. I don't like cats for that. We all did a very interesting. I see my cousin. I saw my sister. I saw my former work friends. I love you. This all. is my niece with the cat out here. Uh-oh. Vina. Yes. That's her. Yes. I see you, baby. <laughs> yeah, I love those visual sounds you make. <laughs> mm -hmm. I keep it. Where's your cats? Uh oh. <laughs> I see an image unmute, of a cat. Unmute Firekeeper. You're muted. Firekeeper, we can't hear you. Hello. Unmute. I don't want my face on it. It won't show. My face won't come. It's not I'm trying to figure it out. Click on the video camera. One or the other. It's the tape. Hello. You're oh. muted, Hi, Fire Rick. Keeper. Yeah, hey, I'm Rick. And thank you to everyone you who came, you? wherever you came. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, you're thank welcome, you. you're welcome, you're welcome. <laughs> Good night, Good night everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Oh, oh, okay. oh, there's the oh, cat. There's fire keepers. Brought, uh, titty. Oh, that's the baby. Oh, 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 look at that. Oh, look at, the look at cat. that. <laughs> we got one of the babies. Mm. Oh, oh, my goodness. Oh, oh yeah. you got precious. Good oh. night. Oh. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> Hi, Rhonda. I haven't Rhonda. seen you in a long time. Oh, my goodness, Rhonda. How Rhonda. wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good to see you. Yes. Oh, wow. all right. Thanks for calling me. Yes. I'll see you all next time. Yes. yes. Okay. Next time. It was Bye -bye. so wonderful. We enjoyed Thank it you, all. Omi Yale. Thanks, Omi. Thank you, Omi Yale. Yes, indeed. Good job. Yes. And let's Have get a, a drama. Evening. And get a drama song. Uh, yes. What was his mama name? Anything new, pass it on. Yes, indeed. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yes, thank you. Now, what's his son's name? Bye bye. Oh, very good. Julia. Good night, so, what's that boy doing? <laughs> bye.